Right, so my guests are seated. I have engineer Abdullahi Mahama, who is a road and building consultant, and also Edward Tuto, who is a convener of the Dynamic Youth Movement of Ghana. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. How are you all doing? Fine. Yeah. After <laughs> after last night's rain. Yeah, well, Edward, yeah. where were you last night when it was when it was raining? Um, at my end, it started raining around uh, two a.m. and it continued all the way. It came to the afternoon. It stopped for a while. Then around three p.m. it started all over again. Okay. So practically yesterday, I had to work at home. Wow. Yes. So that's almost like a, more, it's more than like fifteen hours, eighteen oh, yeah. hours. And, and and the rains were sort of incessant. It, it yeah. wasn't too hard of a rain mm. but you know consistent like that yeah. dropping dropping yeah and i think from experience those ones are even more deadly than the ones that rain hard at a time and it will just come to an end yeah so i knew that it was going well to be engineer is going to explain some of this, this oh okay all right <laughs> <laughs> so how, how what was your experience yesterday uh, i was out of town yesterday okay. i was in uh, around the eastern region, okay. precisely the Pedra area. Mm. So I was even coming down to Accra, and I realized that the class are formed around the Pedra as a thing. So I inquired from my supervisors on site, and they said it was raining, so I had to just return mm. back. So I just came you this You came this morning? Yes. Wow. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for coming <laughs> in. All right, so well, let's, mm. let's, let me quickly go through um, one, the first story. We want to talk about the torrential rains that we're experiencing, and uh, we want to take the story from our portal. And then um, I will. We will have a conversation. So, police caution drivers after Accra Tema floods. Let me read that quickly. The Ghana Police Service has warned the general public and to motorists who may be plying the Accra Tema motorway to be cautious after a downpour on Monday flooded part of the stretch. The flood has caused massive gridlock on both. Uh, Accra and Tema bound sides of the highway as drivers are compelled to remain in traffic for hours. A number of vehicles also broke down after their drivers attempted to go through the water on the road, which was at window level for some of the smaller cars. The Ghana Police, the Ghana Police uh, Service, in a post on its official its official page, urged drivers to take extra precaution as they ply the stretch. The Accra Tema motorway is flooded due to the downpour uh, this afternoon, that's yesterday, uh, 28th October, um, rainfall. All right, let me just read quickly um, another st uh, story from um, Kumasi, and then we'll tie, we'll tie it in. Um, a six-year-old uh, pupil dies after downpour. Reports from Ashanti region in indicate that a six-year-old uh, primary school pupil has drowned in Moshi Zongo, a suburb of Kumasi, following a 30-minute downpour on Monday afternoon. The incident, which has been confirmed by the Ashanti Regional Director of the, of the NADMO, uh, Kobna in Century, uh, adds up to 10 of such deaths this month. According to the director, the incident occurred at exactly 5.53 p.m. on Monday evening. When asked to confirm the number of deaths recorded in the region, the director responded the figure was 10. All right, so let me start with you, Engineer. Um, what's, what's the cause of where we find ourselves now? And I know it's a hydra-headed question, yeah. you know, so just... Let's attempt. Are we going to add, add the the video I clip, or we take we the will discuss that as a second topic? Yeah. Yes. The the first issue is the growth in discipline, and uh, the so-called elites who are so powerful, who are so rich, uh, undermining the powers or the authorities of the local assemblies. Most of the time, this information or this issue had to be laid squarely at the doorstep of those who are issuing mm. the permits. Mm. That's where it starts from. Mm. Because God is in all wisdom has created mm -hmm. the mountains yes. and then the valley areas where when the floods come with that velocity, they, they actually uh, inundate the floods and yeah. the environment. Yeah. Now, when you see the motorway, at the time that it was constructed, the left-hand side, that's when you are time bound, yes. was a rice farm. Because I lived in Ashima when I was young, so okay. I used to experience those. Okay. You have to go there and even do some fishing. Mm. Now, all those areas have been taken by industries, and huge ones for that matter. Mm. You see, when we are doing road construction, we actually try to elevate the road, say, a, a meter and a half above the adjoining land, mm. so that 
at any time that you are driving, you don't uh, uh, confront, you are not confronted with the water yeah. on the surface of the, mm -hmm. because uh, it reduces the, uh, what we call the viscosity, as well as the slippage. Now, if you look at the, you see, the, even the U-turns that we are, unapproved U-turns are contributing mm -hmm. to the floods, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Okay. You see, when you see the, the motorway, there are two roads which are at separate with the median. Yes. And they are cumbered. One has to come, they are just like in a, in a shape like that. Yes. So that it falls at both sides. Yes. Now the median is supposed to intercept the surface runoff, mm -hmm. the direct water that comes onto the surface. Yeah. And it is channeled through the median drain. And then intermittently you see that this catch pit covered mm -hmm. with an opening. Yes. So both sides of the median drain is supposed to empty their water into the catch pit mm. and, and then, then go out. Go out. Yeah. Now the U-turns that are happening on the motorway is because if the place is still in the valley, you cannot have the U-turn. Yes. So obviously people are putting damping material, yes. sand and other things. It. And then so now we have localized flats. Mm. Because ordinarily the water would have channeled itself through the median yes. and then empty at the intersection at the catch, catch pits, okay. which have been produced and provided along the motorway. Okay. It's about 18 kilometer stretch or so. Yes. Now, so if you have 20 of those catch pits, and then out of the 20, it's about only about five which are functioning. Function. There are about 15 which are coming with the water. Mm. And the runoff is so intense that the after some time, when the water gets to the catch pit and doesn't enter the catch pit, it will backflow spill up and then spill up into the road. Yeah. So that's one. Okay. So this, your war against indiscipline, it can also have a, a long way to also affect positively mm. about the floods we have on the road. Secondly, the inlet and outlet of all the culverts on the motorway, uh, we know that some of them have been turned into underpass, mm. but the other ones which are still functioning as culverts, when they come out at the empty, the exit point, yeah. they are facing structures. They are facing huge edifices. And you see, some of those edifices cannot uh, function properly if the owners do not go and buy boulders at shy hills and yeah. areas or the wooded material to, to build up. As a foundation. Because all so that area is hardening the ground. Yeah, you are, okay. it's a swampy area. Okay. So if the, let's say the road is about one meter high mm. and then the cover is about three meter down, mm. obviously the engineers then would have done a survey, extensive survey to yeah. know where the outlet is. Mm. So the, the culverts were not put there in vain. Mm. They are supposed to channel the water through a certain distance. Mm. Now all those distances have been approved by the Thermal District Assembly or the Metropolitan. Yeah. And then all those buildings there are blocking the water. So that's what I said. You don't get an ordinary uh, citizen mm. who can buy or can improve the land by three times the cost of buying the land. Mm. Those lands around that area, the average you can have is about 80,000 Ghana per, per plot. Mm. And before you can get to the state where you can actually uh, build on that facility, you might go three times the cost mm. to improve because it's high swampy, yeah. high mattress clay, okay. which expands so fast yeah. when it just it gets uh, contact with water. Mm. So those who are doing the construction there are part of the blame. Mm. And then who are those who are giving the, the permits? Is the local assemblies. Yeah. And some of the local engineers are so toothless because you see the channel of communicating an approval. Yeah. You go to an assembly, you have works committee who are supposed to approve of a, a permit. Mm. And out of the technocrats, you have only two or one engineer. The rest are assemblymen. With all due respect, okay. we need to, if we can't, mm. so if we want to approve such facilities and we are bereft with the idea, we need to consult other people yeah. and then search out the clients. Mm. But you go to an assembly, there are maybe 10 people, one engineer, nine assembly men and the presiding, and then the district chief executive, mm. approving of permits. Yeah. What background um, uh, experience do they have in the flood controls? Mm. And that is the way the crux of the matter. As long as we have land use and special authority who are shaking their responsibilities, mm. this wouldn't stop. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Let me come, I'll come back to you again in a minute. Let me come to Edward. Um, what's your, how would you make of all this? Um, some from what the uh, engineer is saying, the negligence of uh, um, duty bearers yes. and so on. What, how do we move forward? All right, thank you very much. Let me say good morning to yourself, your team, and our viewers out there. I think that when it comes to disasters like flood, it is a natural phenomenon that nobody can control. And uh, nature is in a constant state of evolution. Topography of lands change, weather, climate. So the, the, the nature of a particular landscape, let's say 10, five years ago, cannot be the same because changes do take place. And that is why it is important that whenever we roll out a project, there should be constant supervision. We bring together our expert minds, 
to supervise, to keep observing the environment, to ensure that the project is going to be protected, safety is not going to be compromised, and most importantly, we can anticipate any foreseeable danger in the near future so we could mitigate against it. Yesterday, when I saw the videos, I was so surprised mm. because flood taking over the motorway, cars could not, could not move. At a point, somebody was, I, I heard in the video that you, you now need a canoe to cross the motorway mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. no more a car. That is danger over there. And I think uh, um, in my little years on, on this earth in Ghana here, this is the first time I've seen the velocity and the volume of water mm -hmm. taking over the motorway. Mm -hmm. That should give us a signal that in the near future, it could be worse. And as usual, we'll have to wait for the disaster to happen. Lives are going to be claimed before you see all of us running helter skelter, people commenting here and there, our leaders going to the site to go and pay visit and all that, before we know that really something has happened. I think that it's about time we acknowledge that when it comes to disaster management, a great deal of the process has to do with anticipation. Mm. And that is why I think we have our experts who have been trained and they can really anticipate looking at certain events that are happening within the environment and most importantly other activities that are going on elsewhere mm. that has a great potential to affect what is likely to happen in a particular locality okay. and i think all these things have been absent so for me i would say it is a wake-up call now going forward i believe we need to appreciate that we the citizens we have a role to play and government also has a role to play because if government tries to come out with visible policies, it's going to be harsh. And you know, most of us, whenever they try to evacuate people from a particular place, they are getting the pedestrians off the street, people who are selling by the roadside, with the citizens, we start issuing threats that will not vote for you in the coming election. So governments are always very apprehensive not to take that bold decision, irrespective of the political consequences, and be mindful of safety, that safety should always come first. So, in fact, I don't know what new we can say in this particular situation again because we have, we have always said it, that our local assemblies, they are in charge. That is why local government is so important. As engineer said, those who give out the permits, if a particular place is flat prone, why do you allow estate developers to come and claim the land? Mm -hmm. If we know that this particular place is a waterway, why, why do we allow people to build in that waterway when we know that nobody can put up a building without a permit from the local assembly, you know? So these are human factors mm. as a result of negligence, as a result of personal, the pursuit of personal aggrandizement, that irrespective of the danger that I know will, will, will arise as a result of me compromising on what I'm supposed to do, then we know that at the end, it is danger that is going shouldn't to come. We be, shouldn't we be prosecuting mm. people at today, this morning? Shouldn't people be mm. dragged? to the police and then to court. I agree totally with you. I agree that when things like this happen, people should be held accountable. But the issue is, where is the political will? <clears throat> Are leaders prepared? Because look, I always say that the reason why we have a machinery called government is because we all have agreed that we should entrust the proper running of this nation, protection of rights, and the dispensation of justice, okay? We should give it to a centralized authority, which we all have agreed through, through democracy, that they should man our affairs. And ensuring safety and security is a good part of this process. So when constantly we have people being negligent, we have duty bearers sleeping on their job, compromising in pursuit of their own selfish interests, when we have people who know that they are supposed to do A, B, and C, their job description has been clearly laid out for them. But they bend the rules. They display incompetence. Sometimes it's not incompetence, but it is just the pursuit of self-aggrandizement, okay? That an estate developer is going to approach me, he's going to give me this so amount, so I can give me the permit to go and build in this waterway. You see? So I think the biggest duty mm. lies on our leaders to ensure that they crack the whip and they hold people accountable for their decisions and the actions that they take. Until we start doing that, it will become a revolving door. It will happen, we'll discuss, yeah. we'll go and sleep. It will happen, we'll discuss, mm. we'll go and sleep. So it becomes a cycle that keeps affecting us, and all we can do is to watch on. All right. Engineer, 
The issue of building in waterways is a, is a major conversation that we've been having, right? Now, I borrow from the example of um, Holland, um, um, the Netherlands, right? They have reclaimed water from the sea and built on it. So with that level of engineering, which has existed for decades now, you know, they've been doing, doing this in, back in, in the 60s and, uh, you know, and so on. So it's not even a new technology, right? My question is, if people want to build on so-called prime land along the motorway, shouldn't there be some of these policies in place or rather enforcement of, of building code? as it were, you know, to, so that you don't, you don't seal the foundation. You have to still allow water to pass, yeah. you know, so that, I mean, I'm thinking that is that not maybe the way we should go? So we say, listen, not, not that you can't build, but if you want to build, number one, it will cost you 10 times the price. Yeah. And then you have to build a certain way. Yeah. Why are we not doing this? You see, the, the development is actually far ahead. The authorities are way behind. So, so that's where the challenge is. Yes, that's the first thing. You see, I drive extensively across the country because mm. of what I do. And you get to districts. You see, just after the district, the next village, mm. you see maybe a huge facility springing up. The assembly is unaware. Mm. They have seen they are not bothered. They think that maybe the developer will catch up with the town in the next 10, 15 years. Before Jack, 10 of such facilities are there. And when you get to that stage, government cannot earmark some amount of money for compensation mm. because you need to now go and actually say okay you see the hydrological service department have the map for the whole country they know all where they have the flat, flat yeah. areas now they they are also in accra they will tell you financial issues they don't have so much money or vehicles to move across the country and be looking at these things but see they have actually apportioned each and every power to the assemblies. There's this new act, which was in 2006, in the Land Use and Special Order Act, which okay. is so explicit. It says, I think in the clause 121, says that the officer, in this case, the assembly, may without notice to the developer, alter, abate, remove, or physically demolish a structure when they consider that structure as a nuisance to wow. the environment or the public right of space. Wow. And this is explicit. If so, you really so really, what you're saying is that based on this act, this morning, there should be bulldozers on the Tema Motorway clearing I'm telling you, if, if the assembly with their technical know-how identifies that mm. those ones are a nuisance to mm. the environment, mm. because the environment yesterday yes. was disturbed, yes. they are a nuisance to the public right of space, mm. vehicles could not go. And so they have to identify the channel. You see, this culvert were 50 years back. So obviously, they had their outlets. Mm. So now if they see that somebody has put a structure 15 meters away from the outlet, that facility ought to go. Like you're saying, if the assembly was apt with development, they would have noticed that before we give a permit to this person who is actually having a facility at the discharge point of the culvert, yeah. we may have to extend the culvert through his facility. So that's why you said mm. that the cost doubles or quadruples. Mm. So okay, you want to put up the structure here. Yeah. But this is a waterway. We are going to double the, the cell to like three cell culverts. Yeah. Where would anticipate that? And what we have, you know, this one that came yesterday, we have something in design we call 50 years design, or 100 years design, or 10 years design. We anticipate that in time we are doing a road construction and we are doing the drainage. Yeah. There will be a time that the, the water that will come, the runoff, will be so much that you have not planned for it. Mm -hmm. So they come once in a while. So in any design of drainage and cover, we have the 25 year design, <clears throat> the 50 year design, the 100. So like what happened yesterday, yeah. or maybe any torrential rain could be catered for. But that one, it will be a bit. Um, the effect will be high, but gradually within a very short time, because they have made adequate provision for it, mm. it will just uh, subside. Mm. So if facilities are actually at the discharge point, yeah. and the assemblies are way behind schedule, mm. the developer is not waiting for you. Yeah. And there's another premise in the, in the permit approval law that when you submit a, a permit for approval, and you have issued the payment, three months after, if mm. you have not heard from the assembly, it is deemed to have been approved. Oh, wow, okay. So you see people are actually catching on our policies. Yeah. <laughs> so if I submit permit to the assembly, yeah. and after three months, they have not uh, actually communicated with me in writing yeah. that there's a problem, we wait. So mm -hmm. we have to do this and this and that. I just assumed that, that you approved it, so I go ahead <laughs> and then start. And at that time, mm -hmm. you cannot just go and demolish. You may have to compensate the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, 
Let's go for a short break. We'll come back and we'll be discussing the Ebri Rockfall. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Ebri Rockfall. Um, basically, the, the, we've jumped from one disaster to another that is looming. Um, let me quickly read a story for you, and then we will have the conversation. All right, so uh, we have a story on citynewsroom.com. It says, uh, building projects on Ebri uh, Mountain to blame for rockfall. This is from the um, Highway Authority. The Ghana Highway Authority has blamed activities of real estate developers on the, mount on the Ebri Mountain for the recent rockfall experienced on the Accra Ebri Road. The authorities also chided the authority, uh, local assemblies, for giving permits for such developments to take place on top of the hill. A rockfall which happened on Sunday is the second in less than a month on the same stretch. Speaking to City News, Public Relations um, Officer of the Ghana Highway, uh, Di Diana Siade, um, was unhappy with the projects on top of the mountain. What was found after the feasibility surveys was that sedimentary rock are eating away. Um, moreover, if you go to the top right now, you'll be amazed at how people have built houses there. That is not the doing of the Ghana Highway Authority, but the assemblies giving permits for this. The assemblies have engineered it, so we don't know what's going on, she said. The activities are contributing to the failure of the slope because some of the projects are right on the slope. If, let's even take the road out of the equation and look at the safety of the individual homes up there. You wonder what they are really thinking, um, what they are really thinking to live so close to the edge of the slope. Okay, she said the authority is putting measures in place to fix the issue. We are closing the road um, so that we will come back and work on it. It is not going to be temporary uh, because it's it's not going to be temporary because it's still raining. The issue is not just about nature failing itself, but the activities at the top by individuals is also putting pressure on the slope uh, because the water is gathering and swelling at certain places and breaking the walls. Okay, hence <clears throat> eroding the earth's surface. Rock masses have also eaten away over time. <laughs> so what we really need to do is to come back and get it over with. She stated. All right. Mm. Now, again, I'll start with you, engineer. The, I, first of all, what she's saying here, um, well, that's, it, it, it makes sense in part. Mm. I'll, I will let you respond to this first of all, but then I will also ask a question after about where I think I can punch holes in her statement. You go ahead and give us your take on this. You know, fortunately, Right after school, that was my first project. Okay. In fact, I was among the team of consultants who actually supervised the construction of that project from okay. Pantan Junction through Oyarifa, Ayemensa, Peduase, Ketase, Ebri, all the way to Manfi. It's about 30 kilometer project. Now, in the olden days, you know, we had a small road, very sl that small uh, median, yes. wide, uh, what do you call it, the span. Mm. And then in 2006, when we were on the construction, uh, the then minister, Dr. Richard Nani, had came there and then we had that proposal of actually widening the road from mm. Pantine to Pedriasa Lodge. Mm. So we realized that instead of filling the valley, it would have been maybe four times the cost and we couldn't even get that material. Mm. So we have to do what we call control split blasting. Mm -hmm. You blast the rock such a way that you can have the beams so that it doesn't come one steep. Yeah. So you have the beams coming down this way so that you can widen the road. Gracefully, that was done. In our technical, uh, we propose you to call it what controlled split, split blasting. blasting. You, know, you okay. can do one mass blast, which mm. might affect the whole mountain, yeah. the rocks. Yeah. So you have to do in bits. Yeah. So we have we call the com control splitting mm. and blasting. Yeah. So you have a way of drilling the, yes. at a certain angle, so that when you blast, it, it will come yes. that from That's what we did. So we realized that once you have disturbed the rock, the mountain, there are fractures. Yeah. And it's not like a granite, mm. like the one we are doing in Sawam, where we have that granite across the okay. bypass. Okay. That one will not come down. Okay. That's one monolithic rock. But this one is weathered. Mm. Material just sedimented. Yes. So once you disturb the rock, you create a lot of fractures, fractures in, there. in yeah. there. 
So even at the time, we proposed to government that, see, we are almost done with the project. We need to protect the slope. Mm -hmm. And the government agreed, and had to, we had to send the cost, I mean, the variation for the approval, which never came until we actually com completed the project mm -hmm. and left. But that was in 2007, okay. when we wanted to actually do the protection. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in that part of our report, we stated that we should make sure that such development at the top there mm. should be far away. Mm. Like when we are dealing with river, you say we have to build about 200, 500 meters away from the river. That was explicit. So that was one of the things because we knew definitely that once you have disturbed the, the mm. rock, it will have such a uh, mm. um, Now, so, so just help us to understand how far away from the edge of the slope should ideally, from your engineering expertise, should buildings begin? It could be 500 or so meters away. 500 meters But back. the buildings are sitting about a meter. Yes. I saw some... You see the, se the second curve? Yes. There's some right at the edge. Yes. La on the 27th day of September, mm. I was descending the mountain. When I got there, there was this track, a shooter. You know, mostly now we, shoot, we do the concrete with a shooter. Okay. If you want to do a very long distance. Yes. Track. So when I got there on the 27th day of September, it, right where we had the mass slide last two mm. weeks, was the exact location where the track was. So I actually took pictures and asked them what they were doing there. Because they had police escorts. Oh, really? Yes. And they were shooting they were, concrete? They were preparing to shoot concrete at the top to there. the top. Wow. And that was where the, the collapse came. Mm. Just around a small distance from the collapse. Mm. Because they knew they, could, they couldn't have gone through the other side yeah. and then cast. They came on the road. There was no approval from Ghana Highway Authority, but there was a the police. The assembly were not in aware. The whole assembly... And then, we're not see, aware of it. before you have access to the highway, mm. either to, uh, adjoining land to actually do anything on the land, you need to seek approval from Ghana Highway Authority. Mm. They are not aware. It's not their fault because they cannot have their eyes everywhere. Of course. But as long as the police were there mm. and the assembly, the MC was not aware, you see that sharp contrast between our so called uh, institutions. Mm. How can an individual come to the police station and then seek the escort of the police to go and construct concrete just at the edge of the slope? And nobody at the assembly was aware of that. that. Mm. Just after 20 days after, the, the first mass light came and the second one happened. Yeah. And this issue that we are talking about that the PRO has raised, if you look at your archives in CTFM, I raised this in 2013, mm. that these are things that we envisaged in 2007, 12 years down the line. Mm. In 2014, the then, I don't know, I don't know, I awarded a contract to a contractor to go and do the slope protection. It was haphazard. Mm. They had, at the point, they had to even change the contractor mm. and then warn the contractor he was not doing So I suspect that that thing was not done properly. Okay, so mm. that's very interesting because that's what I was, going to, I was going to bring up in terms of her, her commentary on this because she seems to be focusing a lot on the, the, the developers at the top of the, of the hill. Yeah. But... What I saw physically with my own eyes when I was there on Sunday was you could see that some parts of the hill have been secured properly. Yeah. And, the, and the blasting that you call, the, the split the con control blasting that you call, you see parts of it well, well demarcated yeah. you know, and protected. Yeah. But then the part where the rocks came down, it seems to have had a flat shear all the way to the top. Yeah. You know, it's like there, was, it, there wasn't, it wasn't secured well. That's what it looked like. Now, where would this have happened? How would this have happened? And what, what should we be doing this morning regarding the people who are responsible for that? You see, um, what you're saying, you see, there, there are about two different types of material there. Okay. One of them was like a, say like a plate. They are sheets. So we have not have those ones coming. You can't have that control blasting product, like to have the beams. Okay. The other place where we have the materials with about 20 mm sizes. Mm. That's the beginning of the human mm. You see that that place is well demarcated. Okay. I mean, well, uh, okay. um, yeah. But the other side, you, it, they come in like those shales. Yes. Of course. So yes. that's why you they have to do the net and then the bolting. So the bolting is also part yes. of it. Okay. Yes. But the activity, like you said, the, just on top of that place, mm. is somebody, the, you see huge areas which have not been uncovered with the with the boulders and okay. uh, doses and uh, excavators. Okay. Now so you, are, you, are, yeah, you, are, no, you have exposed the place. Mm. There's no cover. Mm. So once the water you know, fil infiltrates through the, the samples, they become heavier. Right. And then that pushes, you know, right. once the water wants to find its way down yeah. there, it will still be pushing those things. So yeah. the activity is a key point. The, in the, the development it's at the top there, major ought, issue to, there. ought to stop. Okay. Otherwise, we, like I said yesterday, we'll keep on doing the mm. re remedy. Mm. It will come again because the top there is still getting fractured. Yeah. We are, the fragmentation is still ongoing. Mm. Doses are there. People are actually fencing the whole land there. 
I was telling people to go and put up hotels and other things there. And then the individual down there is now panicking. Now, if you're driving there almost every time, even yeah. after they have opened it again to traffic, you always have that fear yeah. that what if it comes down on mm -hmm. me? Okay. Edward. Yeah. The issue of human activity mm -hmm. and looking into the future, God forbid, mm -hmm. but there are buildings that are actually on the edge. Yeah. As you're driving, there are some buildings that are literally sitting yeah. on the edge mm -hmm. of the slope. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Because, Maybe. I mean, compensation looks like a, <laughs> a difficult thing mm. to do, but mm. we need to do something. I think fundamentally, a project of this kind, situated at a place where the possibility of a disaster, you know, can come up at any time. I know the consultants are going to give a good report. And after everything has been done, in their report, they are going to state the possible safety measures mm -hmm. that the local assembly should be what enforcing. Mm. And you know that the local assembly, be it the DC or the MC, is the head of the security in that particular locality. So I don't think that administratively, the local assembly is aware of the dangers that are likely to arise if they should allow people to build in those areas. But the local assemblies mm. have engineers there with them. I'm, 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 I'm building a point. Okay. So <laughs> the right thing has been done. They are aware. The engineers have done their job. They've handed the possible documents, the security agencies over there. They, they all know. They are aware. But you see, in this country, political power has become a currency that can buy you everything, yeah. including perpetrating illegalities. Yeah. So when we win political power, it becomes a spoil. Okay, what can we use to compensate you? Look, when you go to the Ebrid Mountains, there is a city, a new city that is that is springing up over there. Estate developers have taken up, even after the Pegasi Lodge is going up. Mm. That whole area, there's multi-million dollar mm -hmm. real estate mm -hmm. project going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. It has become a mad rush. Now the question is, who is giving out those permits? when we know very well the dangers that are likely to arise, which will not even ask you of your political power, uh, of your political affiliation if the rock is coming down. Yeah. It is a danger that we are all exposed to. So the very people that compromise on all of us, our safety, by giving out the permits, they are the people that we are supposed to blame. And you know one thing? I'm, I'm so glad that the engineer is here. When that project was completed in 2017, the so-called mesh that they used to hold the rocks, it was not there. Something happened. And I think two people lost their lives in 2013, 2014, thereabouts. And that was when government decided that they were now going to put up those mesh. Yeah. I was driving, there's this special yeah. fufu at the mountains. Eh? <laughs> I like going there on Saturdays. <laughs> I was going there one day with my lecturer, and we, he saw the mesh. He was like, really? Do we really think that if this mountain really wants to fall, this mesh can really hold the mountain? He was so disappointed. And he was actually a, a, a geologist. And he was like, this thing is incompetence. And when we checked, the quantum of funds that has been allocated for that particular incompetence over there. 12 million. 12 million dollars. It was, it, was, it was such a huge figure for, for just a mesh. As if it was somebody who decided to just donate a mesh and just, we put up ladders, get boulders, and we just do. It was supposed to be something that was going to last us for long. And if they had done it well, we wouldn't have had this situation arising. So for me, I think that... So the we, 12 million... The 12 million... Yeah. Um, um, uh, it was 12 million cities? Yes. CDs, okay, yeah. 12 million cities. Um, but where, who, who, has, who, who allotted that money? Ministry of Roads and Highways. It was Ministry of Roads and Highways, I see. And, and you know, after they did that particular project... When they completed, I think about 50 meters, the last, the last bend before you actually hit the Pedrasi Lodge, something happened. And the, and the road has to be carved out for, I think, two months. Immediately they finished doing that. I remember that so well because I'm very familiar yeah, with that for, particular for street. It was, it was, yes. Before we are having these recent ones also upcoming. So the thing is, even if you compromise, even if you bend the rules a little, when the signs start coming up, we need to do the right thing. But you see, when people are so connected to the political class, they have their way. And the political class becomes so, they, they know the right thing, but for the sake of political power, 
you have contributed, you have contributed to my power. So when you want this thing, okay, fine. Let's let, let's just allow him. You understand? These are the things that are going on. And from Ayi Mensa, if you if you if you want to buy a plot of land in that particular mm -hmm. enclave, it's mm -hmm. so much money. Mm -hmm. Simply because it's, it's, it's on top of the mountains. Mm -hmm. Hotels are springing up, uh, resorts, uh, uh, facilities, and, and, and the whole lot. The last time I was there, it was like a whole city, yeah. multi-billion city. That like if you want to have a space in there for any particular type of activity. The last time I heard, they want to put up a mall over there. Where? At the Brim Mountains, a mall, a mini mall. And you ask yourself, where is this particular thing going to take place? We even, I'm even concerned about the security implications. That, that, that place becoming an annex of the office of the president, sort of. And we are allowing all of these things to go on. In the final analysis, we are exposing ourselves. Mm. And one day when you are no more in office, and you decide to go and cool off at the very hotels that you've allowed yourself to be compromised, to be put up, on your way there, when the inevitable happens. <laughs> Mm. All right, now you have, you've sent us some messages, <laughs> and I'm going to go read through the messages quickly before we discuss the issue of power and possible onset or re-onset of the Dumso uh, uh, era. Anyway, um, the message you have said, well, Walanyo in Equitia says, the nationwide flood has nothing to do with our, our leaders. The nationwide flood has nothing to do with our leaders, but only attitude of indiscipline. Um, some recalcitrant people are erecting buildings in inappropriate places and we must rather change our attitudes and keep our environment clean else we will continue to flood every year. Um, I disagree with you, yeah. uh, Walanyo, yeah. because our leaders are there to enforce rules yeah. and give yeah. permits. So people can't build without the permit. It's a leader who has given the permit. And this leader has given the permit knowing very well what the, what the consequences are. Sure. So if that's been done, then our leaders are the ones to blame. Not, not you know, people will go as far as they are allowed to go. Yeah. Um, Sami Boache um, in a man, a says, I think the season has changed and we should also change our yeah. attitude. And behavior, uh, throwing garbage, um, filling our gutters, what do we expect? Uh, it's not a matter of government to clean our gutters for us, but it's our duty as human beings. Uh, don't, don't let us blame anyone. Let's change our attitudes um, and clean our drainages. Um, again, Sami Bache, I don't agree with you. No. Um, I understand that, yes, we have a responsibility to clean our gutters, but there's also the responsibility of our assemblies yeah. um, and other you know, powers and, and that be who are leaders of the land to make sure that they enforce mm -hmm. the, the, the rules that have been set in place. Eric Asa from Kufuidia says, how can we dump solid waste into drains and blame the government for flooding? Ghanaians need to change from our bad attitudes. Again, Eric, that goes to you. Um, this is Mystic from in Sawam Edrejiri. I think some MMDCEs and city authorities are sleeping on their jobs and being paid with no work done. The flood is unfortunate. Can Accra become the cleanest city in Africa as promised? Uh, teacher, uh, a big Bobby, big boss uh, from Teacher Mante says this unforeseen flooding is the cause of why some indigents are homeless in our cities. I urge. MMDCEs and NATMO to amend their regulations um, to put a uh, to put pragmatic measures in place that will prevent such unfortunate disasters and save lives and property. Um, I think we have a lot of rules. We just need to enforce. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of regulations. Mm -hmm. We just need to enforce them. Um, John from Abo says, in fact, at Tamamoto Way yesterday, at Tamamoto Way yesterday, we stayed in traffic for more than two hours on the way uh, from Akimoda because of the f flooding that blocked the road. The funny side of it was that a suspended politician, a suspended politician tried to divert into one of the oncoming vehicles um, um, and got stuck in the mud. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So, um, Temamoto Way, part of Accra flood after the downpour, Nahu Kozam, it's our own doing. The construction of houses and other blocked uh, um, other materials blocking the waterways um, are the ones doing this. Okay, attitudes need to change in our society. This is coming from Ablade in uh, Efiakuma 
Zongo from Takrade. Yeah. All right. I, 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 yes. I, 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 I think that it is a binary approach, okay? okay? Government have their role to play through implementation of policies and enforcing the laws, okay? We, the citizens, we also have our role to play. Very, very important. Oh, yes, so, I, I won't say it's only government yeah, only but or only we, the citizens. But, it's, it's, but it's a binary no, approach. No, but, no, no, but, no, but, no, but, Edward, where I would uh, depart from your position is that people, people will do what they are allowed to do, right? Um, so, if, if, let's say, um, two people are walking down the road and um, we're having an interesting conversation and there's no, there's nothing stopping them from going. Mm. And then they'll keep walking, yeah. right? And suddenly they, they see a, a lion coming in the opposite direction. What mm -hmm. happens? Immediately, <laughs> out of fear, yes. they yeah. change their route, mm -hmm. yes. right? Be behavior only changes when mm -hmm. there's enforcement and it's mm -hmm. strict and harsh enforcement of rules. Yes, yeah, I, 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 I agree. That's, that's what, but what, what, that's, what, what I'm trying to put across is there have been instances where the authority, mm. in an attempt to enforce the rules, they don't get our cooperation. They need to enforce. No, but you see, you know, so need, so that, that's what I'm saying. It is a binary approach. Let's just, <laughs> uh, we need to complement right. our each other's efforts. <clears throat> okay. But just that it's so, it's it just so that in in Ghana here, mm. it is the authority that is rather like a dasika. They are more uh, unenthusiastic about. The enforcement, mm. but under normal circumstance, we should complement each other's efforts. But mm. I agree with you that no, in our part of the world, yes. it is rather the authority it's, that is more <clears throat> often than not complacent in people, the enforcement of the law. People who will take rubbish from their house <laughs> and throw it in the road, where it's like it's like the, the mother says to the child, "Have you not seen that the rain is falling? Go and bring the baller. Come and pour it outside." Oh, yeah, you know. So when that happens, mm. these same people, if they were to move to the UK. The they will not try it. <laughs> they wouldn't dare. Yeah. Do you understand? And that is not because the UK people have a better no, attitude. No. The same Ghanaian yeah. is the one who is behaving differently in a and, different environment. And when they also come here and they see the lags that in the then system, then they become lax. Then they also become like us. They become so like us. The people will do what it is permitted to do. <laughs> anyway, so let's, um, let's get into the last story. Independent power producers are demanding a payment of $1.5 billion uh, dollar debt. Let me quickly read that story. The oh. Chamber of Independent Power Producers <laughs> and Distributors and Bulk Consumers mm -hmm. is demanding the payment wow. of debts owed by the government mm -hmm. and the ECG. The power producers say the cumulative outstanding debts owed it has been has escalated to mm -hmm. one point five billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. The cumulative outstanding debt position of the GOG, and I quote, a loan has escalated to about 1.5 billion US dollars. The CIPBID uh, is once again compelled to ask that the payment mm. of the of obligations to of GOG and ECG be made as a matter of urgency. Mm. Um, immediate disbursement from funds that have built up in, the, in PDS accounts is essential to enable us to continue to produce power. The energy sector is clearly under serious threat, and we would urge government of Ghana and its agencies, including ECG and MIDA, as well as M the MCC, to cooperate and ensure that decisions are taken that enable Ghanaians to have access afford affordably to reliable energy supply. SITBIT demanded in a statement signed by its uh, chief executive officer, Elik Pling Kwabla. Mm. The chamber recently warned that the power consumers could be faced with severe power outages if the debt owed by, its, uh, by the government are not paid. All right. So, um, they, yesterday I listened to yeah. the gentleman, Mr. Apetobo, and he was saying that he admitted on, 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 on Eyewitness News yesterday that yeah. Doomsaw is actually eminent, you know, um, if government does not take the right decisions. What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad that we are here discussing uh, IPPs and the kind of uh, attitude government has been giving them. I think we should all accept mm. that the very purpose why ESLA was brought, that purpose has been defeated. Because ESLA was passed so that there could be a pragmatic 
and stress-free repayment of all the debts yeah. that emanate from the energy sector, especially when it comes to power generation and distribution. So if almost every three months we hear the IPPs coming up, then the revenue we generate from ESLA, where is it? Mm. What do we use it for? Mm. No, these are, yeah. these are questions that we should be asking. Fair question. Because mm -hmm. anytime, you, anytime you buy electricity or you, or you are paying, ESLA is in there. Mm. We are paying. So if these IPPs keep coming back, we are talking about $1.5 billion. Yeah. That's a close amount of money. Yeah. So I, I, I only have one question. $7.5 billion. The yeah. revenue we generate from ESLA. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the other. Good question. What do we use it for? Mm -hmm. Because if government is getting that revenue and still we are owing IPPs, then it means something is wrong somewhere. I think that government will just come out and, and tell us, Ministry mm. of Finance, Ministry of Energy, they should come and tell us what, what is ESLA and what they are using the ESLA for. Before okay. maybe we can proceed with any other discussion. Mm. Uh, engineer, any final thoughts on this this, mat this matter here? Yeah, I was here on eyewitness. There was a mockery of Dodua uh, residents who were going to buy power, mm. tripaid, mm. and they were asked to come and pay 45 cities more because you were owing. Yeah. How can somebody go oh, on, on, on a prepaid? Prepaid, prepaid yeah. Just yesterday, was yeah. your news? It's a good question. I, I, I've encountered that three times. A prepaid? Hmm? I have encountered a prepaid. A prepaid. Yeah. You, are, you are owing on prepaid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you see, that is the mockery. It's, it's, not to, it, it's an insane it question. Beats, it beats an You see, and then government always want to do mm -hmm. oh, this meet. We want to go and get these prepaid meters for all the institutions. It's not working. So you see, if everybody is compelled to have a prepaid meter, I think most of these things will be catered. But government is owing more than 80% of why, the amount. Why doesn't government kit all their offices? Every, every ministry, every department, every agency should have prepaid meters but it's so that if they don't pay their bills then off. they just stay in darkness it's up to them <laughs> but that's what is happening they've said it over and over again they started about but they're some not, years are they ago. doing it oh they started some some minutes i think some part of the ministry they are now on prepaid but okay. that would be a, just a fraction but the ministry is not just like that look at all the local assemblies yeah see if you're if you're actually having an office you have a two air condition and you are prepaying when you're even going out for like 30 minutes it's off but you go to the ministry and see what is there. Yeah. It's, it's on like from 7 a.m. when the minister is not even in office or the desk is not even in office. The cleaner goes to clean the place and you're on the AC around 7 o'clock awaiting the, the directors uh, uh, coming at 9, 9 a.m. He goes for lunch for two hours. It's, on, it's still on because they are not paying directly. Yeah. I have an institution in the Greater Accra here which we went to do some tests last two weeks and then when we go there, the meter, they, they, they were owing for the 6,000 guys. It's a government institution. Yeah. So like I was saying, if they start like that way, mm. there will be some efficient management of it. And the second, you see, mostly when they are going to areas where they, they, they are scared to go, yeah. you see, this is a no-go area. <laughs> if, like in water, mm. you know, you can actually segment all areas and say, okay, this area has one meter which is supposed to feed this place with one megawatt of power. Yeah. At the end of the month, we are supposed to have that equivalent in cash. Yeah. If you're not getting that money, it means that there's some illegality going mm. on within that in area. But we know the problem, how to we solve it, implementation it. is yeah. different. Okay. But if you, go to, you want to go for a meter, yeah. they tell you come back in three no, months. No, no, that one is another crazy area. <laughs> uh, <yeah. Okay. laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, to you, Engineer <laughs> Ed Abdullah Mahama, who is a road and building consultant, and then to Edward Tuto, who is uh, called the convener of Dynamic Youth Movement of Ghana. Thank you to you very much for um, staying, watch, uh, staying to watch this show and sending us messages, interacting with us. We're grateful to you. My name is David Sechi. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The City Tube. For exclusive breakfast daily content and other City TV programs. Like, comment, and share with your friends.